Well, thanks again, everyone, for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, really excited to talk about year end. Uh, my name is Blake. I'm the director of traffic and conversions here at Community Boost. So I've been here for about six years, um, really focus on leading our specialist teams. So I've pioneered a lot of our channels that we use to advertise for our partners, whether it be Facebook, Google Ads, LinkedIn, um, kind of have my hand in all of that. So I should be able to answer most of your questions. But really today, I wanted to take the time to walk you through some of the biggest tips that we've learned as I'm going into my sixth year end here. Um, some of the things that should help, you know, expedite that process for you and also have you see the, the biggest return uh, in your investment for year end. And it looks like we already get, have some questions in the chat. Hi, Katrina, welcome. So before we even get started, I have a, a question I wanted to pose for you all. I wanted to know, have you already started thinking about your year end campaigns for 2021, whether that just be on fundraising, um, you know, just general appeals, um, even just like a general idea of what your theme is going to be for this year. A lot of quick responses in the chat. Yes, yes, yes. I love to hear it. It's funny. I did a similar presentation to this just a month ago and most of the answers were no, 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 no. And that worried me. So <laughs> I'm glad that this group is on it. That's great to great to hear, even if it's just concepts. Um, and hopefully some of the things I share here today will help you with finalizing that approach if you haven't already. So cool. The very first tip uh, is don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, you really can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And it's so important that you evaluate your past fundraising campaigns from the last year or a couple years prior so that you can understand which methods um, to keep in your advertising strategy or just fundraising strategy overall and which to leave behind. Really, the goal is to use those past wins as a roadmap to success. And so here are some of the key questions we ask our partners before we even get into talking about year end strategy. And so some of these key questions are, what was your average gift amount last year? What was the average cost per donor? What campaigns raised the most money? What advertising campaigns raised the most money? Um, which channel were the highest converting? You know, there's a lot of different questions that you post, but starting with those basics are so important. It's like the building block of having a successful campaign for the next year. Um, and really these types of questions help you build a data-driven year and given strategy. And most importantly, help you benchmark and track the success of future campaigns. And so I wanted to share an example of actually one of my partners from 2020. Um, we ran Facebook advertising together and they're Lifting Hands International. They're amazing organizations that support refugees in a lot of different areas, um, specifically those in Greece come from Syria and, and some other areas. Um, and this was their first time actually running like a deep Facebook advertising campaign. And so there was a lot of learning <laughs> he had from these campaigns and they were investing like a pretty good amount, a good chunk for them in advertising. I think between October, November and December, I think we spent around, I want to say five to 10,000 in, in that range. Um, and together, we put together a roadmap uh, presentation, basically taking the data that they had from their campaigns. Um, they also use a tool called Fundraise Up. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They're one of our partners as far as donation platforms go. And it's very easy to get data life, lifetime value of a donor. Um, you know, total donations from a recurring giving program versus one-time donation. So we basically took all of the data that we had there and we were able to look at a couple of different things. Firstly, how successful were our paid advertising efforts? Um, one of the scales we had here, we could see when our advertising efforts scaled and when donations scaled. We were able to see revenue by program and then we were able to see specific Facebook posts and ads that performed the best. Um, just a quick question, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but are the are the people that are here familiar like with the Facebook pixel and with pixel advertising in general? Bring some, some chats here. Yes, yes, the majority of people are awesome. Um, it looks like just a couple aren't. 
just a quick refresher, Facebook Pixel is the tool that's used for tracking. So you can actually see what kind of um, results impact you're making with your advertising. And it helps you track return on ad spend and overall return on investment. Um, just for those of you, and I'll get into this later in the presentation, but for those of you that don't know, iOS 14 updates from Apple have made it a little bit more challenging to actually track conversions that are happening on Facebook. Um, but tools like Classy or Fundraise Up are currently actually working on integrations that help with tracking, even when someone opts um, out of tracking through iOS 14. So that's really cool to know if you're worried about tracking this year for, in your advertising efforts. Um, something to keep in mind. But, it's going to rain tomorrow. We'll see. Hi, everybody. I think we're, we're going to go through this presentation right now. If you okay. yourself, that would be awesome. And if you have any questions whatsoever, you can ask those in the chat or we can save them yep. for the end. Give me one minute. Sure. Um, so here were the main things that we took away from this report that we put together. Um, we actually ended up seeing which days we saw the most engagement on our ads and conversions on our ads, which is going to be crucial for a 2021 strategy. Know which days we want to scale. And that's actually one of my tips that I'll get later on, or get to later on in this report. We actually saw that the majority of our impressions and conversions came from mobile campaigns. And so since this was our first campaign, we kind of, we ran the whole, the whole gambit, but this year we're going to be really focusing on mobile campaigns um, and doubling down on those. We also saw, and this is very interesting, that those that gave during Giving Tuesday that became one-time donors actually were our highest converting recurring givers during year end. So we actually took all of those new first time donors and we remarketed to them through Facebook advertising. And that was one of our best performing audiences from moving them to a one time donor and to a recurring giver. So it's very fascinating and something that we want to capitalize on this year, uh, especially using Facebook events and tracking through fundraise up. And then we also found that early top of funnel campaigns, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, were helpful for remarketing traffic. So last year we ran a very specific kind of advertising. It's a tiered style where we start with a top of funnel, mainly just branded advertising, um, focusing on getting attention and engagement and just views on our ads, a lot of video. And then once we had those people watching our video for a certain percentage of time, we remarketed those people later on for giving Tuesday in year end, then making an ask of them to donate or support the, the mission. So starting with just a very general branded ad, um, not even really asking much just for them to keep an eye out for future ads, and then asking them to move into a donor or a recurring giver later on down the line. And that worked very, very well. And it looks like we do have some questions in the chat. So let me just go through these really quick. Um, perfect. I'm having report envy. <laughs> Love the dashboard for appeal, appeal versus gifts raid. Um, is that a tool you they use? I can actually check. Um, it's a tool that they used. We just supplemented with the data from Facebook and from Fundraise Up, but I, I can follow up on what exact tool that they use later on because, yeah, it is a pretty cool uh, dashboard that they created. So, just another uh, question for you all Have you used Facebook advertising for your year end campaigns? A lot of you are familiar with the Facebook Pixel, so I'm sure you are. Um, and if you have, do you have your goals separated out for each step of the funnel? Yes. Uh, failed miserably last year. Some people saying yes, no. Some people saying no, it isn't worth spend so far. Yes, but not separated by funnel. Okay, that's actually good. This is awesome because I, I wanna make sure that the things that I'm sharing with you um, are new and I'm not just uh, preaching to the choir here. So, Perfect. Let me just explain a little bit about what I mean. So for those of you that haven't had success with Facebook or you failed miserably, I would love at the end of the presentation to talk to you about that and see if we can get to the bottom of why that's the case. Our team also, um, we do a lot of free audits. So if that's something you were interested in, we could actually dig into your business manager, ad manager, and, and see why things performed or, or why they did it. But one of the key things to use in Facebook, and one of the reasons why a lot of people don't find success in, with advertising in Facebook, is because one, 
the the channel isn't extremely intuitive as far as tracking and setting things up they don't have a lot of honestly they don't have a lot of support um forums or or resources it's kind of you just have to figure it out on your own so that makes it really tough and then secondly the key to finding success in facebook is really how you track and segment different audiences based on how they've engaged with you for example you know if someone's reached your donation page but they didn't actually follow through and donate we call that an abandoned checkout and you can create audiences based off of only people that have gone really deep in your funnel deep down your website and almost donated to you or on fundraising pages and almost donated to you but didn't and remarket to those people that's like the golden audience that you want to target but there are also a lot of other audiences based how they how they've engaged with you whether it's your facebook page been to a facebook event um, or you know signed up for an event you creating different audiences based off of all those people and how they've engaged with you is the key to finding success in facebook and it's all done through the facebook pixel and the events tracking um so we'll get into that a little bit later on i went a little off track but tip number two here is, is engage with donors well before year end um you know something i i like to to say or we say at community boost is that your donors aren't necessarily your donors, especially because of Giving Tuesday and year-end advertising saturation. There's just so much noise. Um, you know, people that have donated to you last year might not necessarily donate to you this year or support you this year. And so it's really important that you're not waiting too long to re-engage with them. Um, and a key is just to think about, you know, what can you do to keep your donors informed engaged with your mission and expecting advertisements or you know expecting solicitation throughout year end and having multiple touch points to ensure that they feel involved is really one of the keys there um, so whether that be emailing them early in an email series and saying like hey this is kind of our theme for giving tuesday and we're just reaching out to even just thank you for your support last year and want to let you know that like year end campaign is underway this is what we're going to be doing keep your eyes and ears peeled, um, like really looking forward to your support this year kind of thing. Um, and what a lot of our partners actually do is starting in October, we start to run some of those branded ads that I talked about, not even making any hard asks, just getting the brand awareness out there, having them see our partners, um, you know, re realigning with our partners missions before we get into year end is like really key before they start to give to other organizations. Um, this is something that I'll be sharing with everyone that's on this call. You know, it might not be as relevant to those of you that aren't planning on doing very in-depth advertising campaigns, but we put this together and it's how our team is thinking about the different appeals that we're running on the advertising side. This doesn't include um, email or just like general mailing, but as far as Facebook advertising, display conversion design this is like when we're breaking out our different pieces um, and I, i'd be happy to share this with you all we use asana at community boost but if you want to use another kind of project management tool and see when we're planning on launching these things feel free to do that um, and i'll kind of go through these months and how we think about each month so in september we've already started to repost a lot of the top performing content on facebook Something that a lot of people don't know, and this might be a cool tip for you all, is that you can actually take an old post from Facebook. Um, let's say it was during an observance for your organization, like Suicide Awareness Month or something like that, or World Water Day. You can take a top performing post that maybe got hundreds, if not thousands of likes and shares on it. And you can actually change the copy of that post and you can repost it um, as a boosted post or a normal post on your Facebook. The cool thing about that is that it retains all of the likes and the shares that that original post had. And what that actually ends up doing is if you run that as a boosted post or an ad, Facebook likes the social proof that's already there. It already has all the likes, it already has all the comments. In Facebook eyes, it's been vetted. And so it's really cheap for you to boost that to a lot of people. And Facebook will make sure that it delivers um, because it already has that social proof. So kind of in September right now, or already look going through old posts, finding ones that have a ton of the credibility and reposting those, letting people know about um, our Giving Tuesday campaigns and our year-end campaigns. 
Um, and then we're also in this month starting to build content, getting ready for October, November, and December. Um, in October, we're, we start to tweak a lot of the pit tests that we created in September, and we start actually testing advertising, those branded ads that I've, I've talked about a couple of times here now. Um, and we really, the goal is to engage and attract users with boosted posts and those ads. And then in November, that's really when we start to get into um, our, our full advertising. So start to highlight key giving events, start to mention our fundraising campaigns, whether they're Facebook fundraisers or you know fundraisers ran through something else. And then we start to run some thank you campaigns, um, not really making any asks, but just letting people know that we are so grateful for their support from the last year. Um, and often what's funny is that those thank you campaigns, even though we're just thanking donors, um, end up, they end up donating through those campaigns. And so typically what we're doing on Facebook and Google is we're just downloading past donor lists, uploading them to Facebook and Google, and just targeting those people with a, a thank you ask. And then in December, that's really when we start to scale, um, encouraging supporters, board members, volunteers to use our Facebook fundraisers. And then we really make a push for matching gifts if possible. Awesome. Let's see, we got a couple chats here. Hmm. It sounds like some people here did try funnels, but there was issues with the, the agency and messaging. Um, yeah, Brooke, if you would love an audit or support, we can totally talk about that. Uh, kid number three goes back to what I was talking about with segmentation and personalization. Um, really, and this is a no brainer, but people prefer personalization. Like we've ran so many AB tests, so many kinds of ads. And the best thing that you can really do is be breaking out the different audiences that you're targeting into their own groups and then giving each one individual, unique, personalized messages. Um, not each person, but those, those segments. Um, that's really the key to crafting a good message. Like your supporters feel like you're in their shoes, like you're speaking directly to them um, and their experience. And, and that being said, I know it's not really realistic for any organization to create individual messages for every single donor and supporter, but hopefully some of the things that I share here will help you do it in a way that's efficient and works for an organization. Um, and that's through audience segmenting. Um, so some of the, the ways that we like to think about audience segmenting is current donors, lapsed donors, and prospective donors. Um, and you can also you can also segment your donors by gift sizes if you wanted to, but that's usually the foundation of how we're, we're targeting people in, in Facebook and Google and even with email. What's crazy is the, the automations, the machine learning in these channels have gotten so good that basically if you give them a list of a thousand people that have donated in a certain gift size, Facebook can see all of those gift sizes and will actually start to target people that fit that demographic, whether it's a higher income level, whether it's, you know, areas that they're in. Um, the machine learning is that strong and powerful that you really can do that. Another tip that I wanted to share because a lot of people they say, well, that's a lot of work. You know, we might not be extremely efficient in Facebook ads yet. I don't know how to segment out people or create specific ads for different groups. And Facebook and Google actually make it pretty easy to do this. Um, there are a lot of dynamic tools that help you build ads based off of how someone has met you in your funnel. And so here's an example here. This is from uh, an organization called Jasper's Boutique. Um, and there are three different ads that are built dynamically based off of how this individual uh, engaged with Jasper's Boutique. So it looks like on the far left, there's this carousel ad with shipping info. So that's pro probably someone who made it pretty deep in the funnel, maybe added this jacket to their cart, but didn't actually buy it. And so now they're sending this, this person like a reminder about shipping info. You have a carousel ad with pricing. This is probably for someone who like actually visited the the um, jacket page but didn't add to cart and then we have a collection ad with a lot of different products here that's dynamic and that's probably someone who is brand new to this organization and doesn't know what they're actually looking for and so a, a nonprofit example would be you, you can create a dynamic ad for those that are brand new to your organization cold traffic 
um, just letting them know about the mission. Maybe it's a video from your founder or um, a testimonial from someone that you supported. And then you can actually create a specific ad for someone who went to your donation page. They started the process of maybe filling in their credit card information, but didn't, didn't donate. You could send them an ad that shares, you know, that $5 or $10 or whatever it was that they almost donated to you. Like what would that impact have been to your organization if they had done that? Um, and that can push them back to making that donation. Or like I had mentioned before, if someone had given a one time to you, you can push them into a recurring giving program with very specific copy, um, you know, sharing why a recurring giving um, program actually supports people more and how it's more convenient for the donor. Actually, we can talk about some of those um, those benefits, but that would be kind of how we would break it out. And when I say dynamic advertising, Facebook and Google can actually build these ads for you based off where people have been on your site. So you don't even really have to do too much. They kind of know, hey, it looks like this donation page is important to you. Should we create a specific ad for all people that have reached it? And then you can kind of have that all set up for you automatically, which is really nice. Um, yeah, this, the key here is just really meeting people where they're at. So tip number four is measure what matters. Um, the, the whole goal here is to let data be at the center of your strategy. I don't know how many times I thought I knew exactly what audience was going to perform well, what kind of ad copy was going to perform well, and then those actually were the least, the, the lowest performers. So one, you have to be letting the data kind of dictate the strategy, but it's also really important that you're focusing on the right metrics. So to set yourself up for success, did. identify the right metrics and keep an eye on those metrics before launching. Um, let me go back. Um, it's also really important that you value your best supporters. Um, instead of just measuring transactions alone, it's really important to model lifetime value that you derive from your supporters. A lot of times I've seen campaigns run and we have like a break even return on ad spend. For every dollar we're putting in, we're only getting a dollar back. And that might seem like a failure, but then when you're keeping an eye on lifetime value, which a lot of tools like I had mentioned Fundraise Up and Classy can do that, you see that over time, those people were donating year over year and that first campaign was actually extremely successful. So perspective is really important as well. Um, make sure you're, you're looking at how things are performing across the journey. I know I mentioned like segmenting in the funnel, but that also helps with tracking to see where there's drop off. So if you see that, you know, when, pe when people are moving through your funnel really easily, they're landing on your donation page, they're going to the checkout, everything looks really good and then there's a major drop off. It's important to use tools like Google Analytics, um, Crazy Egg, key mapping tools to see, well, what's going on there? Like maybe there's an actual issue with the donation page itself. Maybe there's too much copy. Maybe you need to cut down on a step and make it more, uh, more streamlined and easier for people to donate. So taking a look at your landing pages is, is really important to strategy overall. And then Prove marketing impact. Like you need to be testing. You can't just run with one gut feeling on what kind of ad you should be running. You should be running multiple. You should always be testing. Um, that's that'll really help you build upon a successful campaign and, and create successful campaigns in the future. So like collectively, these four points can really improve campaign effectiveness. Um, and just like most importantly, help you get a strong return on an investment for your your campaigns. And then we have some questions in chat here. Um, let's see. We have someone said a sponsor spent 70,000. Oh, this was from Brooke talking about uh, her experience with that agency. Yeah, that doesn't sound like it was run pretty well. We can totally talk about that. And then Renata, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right, says tips for what types of things to segment for. Yeah, I think I mentioned some of them here, like, um, I would say that the biggies are touch points, like where are they meeting you? Um, you know, is it your website? Are they on your Facebook page? Are they watching videos? Are they on YouTube? That's like really important. And then segmenting by the type of supporter, are they a volunteer? Are they a one-time donor? 
are they recurring? And then also by donation amount, like that's, those are like the big three. And then yes, this deck will be shared. Yeah, perfect. So here are some of the key metrics um, that you should keep in mind for fundraising. Like what are the number of gifts? What's the average donor amount, average cost per donor, donor retention rate, total funds. Those are all extremely important. Of course, return on ad spend and return on investment for marketing, like total landing page views, a really important one. If you're not familiar with this um, KPI, it's called bounce rate. It's available in analytics and some other tracking tools, but it lets you know of all your channels. So about how people are finding you on your website, what is the rate at which someone leaves your site without taking some kind of action. And so this actually lets you know if people are reaching your site and not doing anything and leaving right away, which means that either there's something wrong with your website and they're not able to find what they were looking for or your advertising is potentially misleading um, and you advertise for something that they're not finding or you're targeting the wrong audience. So really high bounce rate is a good indication that you need to either look at your landing pages and figure out what's going on, or you need to change your advertising strategy. So this is really key, especially when you first launch an advertising campaign to kind of see, well, what's going on? Do, am I actually targeting the right audience here? Um, and then for projects or programs, number of beneficiaries served, beneficiary satisfaction rate, number of hours per project. Those are just like a, some examples that you can do that. Um, and this is extremely important as well. This is more something that you can use when I send out this deck, but it's a measuring checklist before you actually launch your campaigns. So first things first, you need to be making sure you're putting your year end giving campaign front and center on your website. Like there should not be any question when someone visits your homepage that you have a campaign in progress. And within seconds, that person should be able to determine the campaign theme, the goal and how to support. Um, that being said, you can totally test different kinds of campaign themes. So there's a tool called Google Optimize that is free, which is why I suggest it. It's from Google and it'll allow you to test different. Basically, you can change your landing pages and homepage based off of who's visiting your, your site. You could do like a pure 50-50 split to test campaign theme language. 50% of the people that visit your page see one theme and 50% see another. But what I would actually suggest is you can use a tool like, like Google Optimize to test certain language for brand new visitors and certain language for supporters that have been to your site before or past donors. Um, that would probably be the best kind of test that you can do. And the cool thing is, is that Google Optimize is linked to Google Analytics. So you have, if you have Google Analytics on your site already, um, it will know if someone's a, a new user or a returning user, and it, it will decide what fundraising theme page that person sees based off that data. So it's, it's really cool and it's completely free and something that you can set up on your own. It's also important that you use tools like Google Tag Manager to just test your tracking, like do a test donation, make sure it's firing and that you're seeing that in whatever your donation platform or CRM is. Um, and then here's an additional tip. Make sure you're using tools like Google PageSpeed Insights. It's a free tool from Google um, devs. It'll let you see a couple things. It'll let you see if your site is mobile optimized. Hopefully we all know that more people are on their cell phones on mobile more than ever. Um, and that's really the direction that fundraising and advertising is going in. If you're not, if you don't have some kind of mobile component or you're not mobile optimized for those users, you're going to be missing out on a lot of potential donations and just overall traffic. 60% um, of nonprofit site visitors are on mobile. So you can see if your site is mobile optimized. And if it's not, it'll give you some tips on how you can do that. And basically what that means is, is your site loading in a mobile friendly format? Can they actually scroll through your site on their phone or is it all kind of um, disjointed and fragmented? And then you can also use this tool to see how fast your site is loading. Um, is it really slow? That's gonna kill the potential for people to fundraise for you or donate to you. And so this Google PageSpeed Insights will let you see how fast your site is loading. And it'll also let you know where you can save time on load speeds by reducing certain areas. For example, there might be like unused JavaScript on your site. 
Um, you might have like duplicate JavaScript bundles in certain areas that you can remove. Um, and it can save you up to, you know, 10 seconds in load time, which is wild. So getting feedback on this stuff ahead of time and getting this all sorted out is really critical, especially as you're launching your fundraising campaigns. You want to make sure you're not doing anything to deter people from supporting you. Okay. And then tip number five is capitalize on the last three days of the year. Um, this is probably one of the most important ones here. Um, I kind of mentioned this in the Lifting Hands International report. This is actually from Classy, who's one of our partners. Um, I think this was like their 2020 giving report. But really, the, the theme here is don't be afraid to target people that have already donated to you. So many of our partners, when they first engage with us, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to rub their supporters the wrong way. And I, and I totally get that. But I think there's an approach that makes sense that won't rub them the wrong way that will also, also end up being a win-win for you all as well. So kind of the, the theme of Classy's report is we all know a loyal community is the bedrock of scalable work. It's so much easier and healthier for an organization to have a strong recurring giving program than it is to always rely on one-time donations that um, aren't necessarily gonna be there year after year. And so in this report from all the different uh, organizations that are Classy customers, they saw that during Giving Tuesday, from one-time donors, 25% um, actually proceeded to make another one-time gift. 11% made a donation to a crowdfunding campaign when re-engaged. 14% signed up to fundraise or registered for a fundraising campaign. And 10% participated in a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. And really, that was just from making another ask. Um, of course, doing it in a way that made sense, but just by asking again. And those numbers are wild and um, something that you should really keep in mind. It also was some of the like questions and surveys they asked of their, their classy customers or like how they engaged um, donors and no surprise that the majority of these donors when um, surveyed actually won't return until the next holiday season unless they're engaged with very early on. And those that were 30% of 31% of them actually returned for a second gift within six months. So it's important that organizations are reactivating sooner. You know, Giving Tuesday and year end at Community Boost, all of our partners, we make them run or we uh, strongly suggest they run a donor thank you campaign in January, just thanking people for supporting, not making any other asks. And those usually actually drive additional donations. So our campaigns run usually until January 10th. Um, it really is in the timing as well. Like you want to make sure you have fast donation checkouts, which is why I talked about site speed and checking your tracking. And then Classy saw that strong recurring giving, it's game changing. It's five times the average donor lifetime value and more. So making recurring giving asks so important. If you don't have a recurring giving program, you need to get on building that. Um, and some considerations. So if you are in, in more need of recurring gifts, what we had found is just be straightforward about it. I know that might be um, op might seem oversimplified, but just explaining the difference of a one-time gift versus a recurring gift and how that impacts your organization, that seems to be enough to move people from a first-time donation program into a recurring program. Um, and some of those benefits is that often it's more convenient to donate through with an organization, or excuse me, it's more convenient to donate through an automated recurring program. It helps that person stay connected with the organization and know where their money is going. And it means that they can also give small monthly gifts instead of one large gift. And I think of all the recurring giving programs out there, um, Charity Waters to Spring has just done extremely well. Um, they've done a, a great job of cultivating a community that they're consistently checking in with, that they're making feel very special. Um, they have their own emails that go out to those people. They have their own group um, you know, on Facebook and other places where they're getting engaged with by the organization and just, yeah, ultimately made to feel very special. It, it's an extremely effective program and something where I'm sure we're all familiar with the charity water here, but if you're not familiar with the spring or how they run that program, um, you should definitely check it out. There's there's a lot of learnings to be had from how, how they run that program. 
And then the last tip here, got a couple more questions in chat. 70% of our traffic is desktop. That's awesome. And it's great that you know that. Um, yeah, that's definitely higher than what we're starting to see right now for a lot of organizations, but it, it does depend on the demographic of who you're targeting um, and what your organization does. We have old people, she says. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, cool. The last one here, the last tip is video is king. And I'm sure you hear this all the time. You know, there's been this big push for organizations to be running more and more video. So this might seem self-explanatory, but I wanted to share a couple other reasons why video is important um, now more than ever that you might not have heard of before. The first, you've definitely all heard of this. Um, video ads just generally create an emotional connection and make it easier for you to engage with people. I mean, the power of video kind of goes back to storytelling 101, just show, don't tell. And video testimonials kind of offer a direct window into what your organization does without your without having to explain yourself um and so it's it what we find especially people that are on mobile video is a great way to just capture the user's attention and it's great for those top of funnel campaigns that i mentioned um you know brand awareness or engagement campaign with a quick video about what your organization does is really uh, an easy way to build remarketing collateral or remarketing audience pools for donation campaigns later on down the line. Um, and then a, a cool thing, you know, we get a lot of pushback from organizations about, well, we don't have a videographer or we don't know how to create a video. We don't know how to do that. Um, but because Google and Facebook want to make this um, something that people, advertisers are using more, they've made it really easy to build these um, yourself. So paid Google ads actually has ad formats and display and video where you can create your own video, you know, through their tools and it's completely free. Um, so it's a, and it's a very easy setup process. Um, same with Facebook, like you can even take still images and upload those into Facebook and they'll create kind of almost like a slideshow video for you. And that's still very effective. And, and honestly, nowadays with iPhone cameras, like, the, some of those iPhone videos are some of the most effective advertising that I've seen. Like it really comes down to the story. It really comes down to like how you're sharing, engaging with that person. It's not about the video quality necessarily. Um, it's also, so number two, it's a great way to diversify your marketing mix. Often we find that video campaigns are cheaper than like other kinds of campaigns also because not as many people are testing it. So like the rule of thumb is on Facebook and Google and any kind of advertising cha channel, if they come out with a new way to advertise, whether it's video or lead forms or something else, if it's in beta or it's new, it's gonna be very cheap to test it because they wanna get the, the data on how it's performing. And so that's kind of the incentive. They're gonna make it cheap for you to test. So if you do have advertising budget, um, testing those tools is usually a good idea. And like I mentioned, you don't need a videographer. Like you can do long tail, short tail, iPhone video, whatever you think fits your organization and your brand, just, just test it. And lastly, video helps with iOS 14 tracking. So I mentioned this a bit, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, basically iOS 14, the new update from Apple, gives users the ability to opt out of tracking from um, basically pixel tracking on websites. So whether it's Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, email even, um, users won't be tracked once they go through the funnel. But what's nice about video ads is that people aren't typically clicking from the ad to go somewhere. They're watching the video and then kind of continuing to stroll on. But what that does is because that video is in on Facebook's platform, that's considered first party data. And so when people watch that video, you get to track that person. I mean, they're choosing to opt in on Instagram or Facebook and by engaging with certain posts, they're kind of, um, yeah, allowing advertisers to use that data however they see fit. And so it really helps with campaigns where we used to focus on traffic campaigns as trying to send as much traffic to site to now focus on collecting that first party data and then remarketing to those people and then have them come to site or a fundraising page and take some kind of action. Um, it really helps. 
you can't really rely on normal remarketing tracking through pixels anymore. And we'll, I'll leave you with this last thing. Um, something you should be paying attention to are YouTube preview ads. Not many organizations really think about YouTube or even know about the advertising capabilities and what's offered there. Um, and this is one of, in my opinions, the best YouTube case studies out there. Um, here are some of the reasons why you should use YouTube. One, it's way less competitive than Facebook. Um, so a CPM or cost per thousand impressions is about two dollars. So you can meet, you can reach a lot of people very cheaply, and that's before it's optimized. Like a full campaign, I, I see cost per thousands of impressions for a dollar or under a dollar. It's a lot of people. Um, what's also cool is that you actually only pay when someone watches more than 30 seconds of your ad. So this is called a true view ad um, where, and I'm sure you've seen this, if you've been on YouTube and right before your video starts an ad plays for 30 seconds and then you can skip it maybe after it plays for five seconds. Anyone that skips that ad before watching the full thing or the full 30 seconds, you don't get charged for it. So essentially it's like free impression share, free visibility um, and so this cost per 1,000 impression doesn't even include all of the free impressions you're getting for people that don't watch the full video. So it's pretty awesome. There, there aren't any other advertising channels that I know of that have this kind of feature. Um, and what's cool, it actually pre-qualifies pre this person for retargeting. I don't know about you, but if I'm watching a 30 second video or an ad on YouTube before I'm about to watch my video, I'm probably pretty engaged. I'm either pretty engaged or I left to go grab something like water or something. Um, but it, often it really helps pre-qualify this person for another ad, whether it's on Google or something else. And because YouTube is a Google product, you can easily remarket to those people through display, through paid search, through another YouTube ad. Um, so it's a great top of funnel traffic builder. And it's way easier to tell a story on YouTube. Um, you know, I was actually, I found this ad because I was doing some research on like World Water Day and just other organizations and what they were up to. And the Charity Water Marketing Team did a great job at putting their video in front of, or their ad in front of another video about World Water Day. So you can actually choose those placements um, and, and decide what kinds of videos you want your ad to show up on, which is also great for pre-qualifying. And this, this ad blew me away. Um, it, it kind of destroyed every notion I had about how to get, do strong video and in, in advertising. This video is, this ad was 20 minutes long. Um, it had 21 million video views. And this is probably from a couple of weeks ago. So probably way more since then. It had a thousand plus positive comments on it. And like I mentioned, it was long form. It was 20 minutes long. And these are just some of the screenshots that I saw from this video, you know, best ad ever. Period. I've never been captivated. I've never been captivated by like, but like this by a humanitarian cause. Um, I'm glad I didn't click to skip this ad. This truly touched my heart. I hope for the best for this initiative. It's just thousands of comments like that. And granted, it's charity water. Like they put a lot of work into this video. Um, you can tell it's very high quality. But still, this is, I think. I look to Cherry Water and their team and other big organizations, what they're doing to stay on the bleeding edge of advertising and the fact that Cherry Water is testing YouTube and having such strong results, I think is enough um, for other organizations to test as well. And the nice thing about this is you would only really need to put $100 into it to test to see how it performs. And you would be able to run that for a month or two months even um, based off the cost per 1,000 impressions. So. Um, just something cool that I'm very excited about and like to nerd out on. And hopefully for those of you who don't, don't have huge marketing budgets, you could test on something like YouTube instead. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions in the chat here. Um, let's see. So Katrina, maybe we can hit these. I don't really have anything left here, so I can hit some of these questions. Um, in the Q and A, and I think we're pretty good on time. About only 50 minutes to go through all that. So, just quick recap. Thanks everyone that stayed on. Um, really appreciate your time. So, the first tip is just analyze your data from past year-end campaigns as well, and 
friends from 2021. Um, use data to guide everything that you do. Make sure you're pushing recurring giving. And if you don't have a program, try to, to build one, even if it's like a, a light recurring giving program. And lead with video for best results on paid advertising and to work around iOS 14. Awesome. Perfect. Well, should we get into some of these questions, Karen? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the chat kind of started um, getting popular when you're talking about video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Katrina mentioned that she keeps hearing video is king. And, you know, while she wants to agree, it doesn't necessarily drive the best engagement for them and that photos consistently perform better. And um, some people agreed, they found that people engage with video more, but often convert less. Mm -hmm. um, what what do you kind of know about that? Yeah, I think that's actually pretty fair. Um, you know, usually if people are on a, on a platform, they're there to browse and do whatever they're going to do. And it can be hard for someone to watch like a 30 second video and then expect them to convert. A lot of those video um, like ads or campaigns are actually not meant to convert to. Um, we, we, when we say that they're king, are so great for top of funnel but I agree for a lot of our partners we usually will use some kind of dynamic ad or something else to get people to donate or take action but we start with those video campaigns to build their remarketing audiences and that's key top of funnel tier one use those videos like you said they usually help with the most engagement um, and then from there try to remarket those users with the same kinds of ads that you're using those one-off um, images and see if you can find some success with that. Awesome. And I think Isabel wanted to know, um, when you were talking about iOS 14, um, if Private Relay was Apple's iOS 15, what the difference between those are. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not familiar with the term Private Relay, but yeah, as far as users being able to opt out of advertising um, in Apple apps, that's already a thing. Uh, I'm sure you might have seen this, or maybe you, you didn't see it, but with the, the new update, Apple kind of had this pop up that would say, like, would you like to, um, you know, opt out of advertising tracking in, in Apple apps? And that's already upon us. Like, we saw. We're, there's a there's some ways to work around it, but basically I think this kicked off in March of this year and we saw significant drops in tracking capabilities. Really at the end of the day, it's not that less people are converting due to iOS 14. It's just that we have less data, like less data integrity uh, that we can attribute back to our ads. So both on Google and Facebook back in the day, you could, if someone clicked on an ad, we had a 30 day attribution window. So even if someone didn't convert right away, but up to 30 days, then took an action, that would retroactively change the data in our Facebook accounts and let us know where that person donated from. And as we all know with donations, it's not like buying a product necessarily. You know, those, those buying cycles are a little bit longer than buying shoes. It can take up to a month for someone to actually donate. So. Right now, the window has been closed to seven days for attribution. Um, we have less attribution and we can't track users that have opted out. So it makes it a lot harder. So video is really important for that. Like I mentioned, first party data, being able to remarket to those people. Um, and also using tools like Conversions API, which if those of you that are running Facebook might have seen this recently, get updated in your business manager, your ads manager. But it's essentially a way to um, still collect data through like server side tracking based off of the, the normal, um, website pixel tracking. Awesome. And Katrina wanted to know if the ad, like the one charity water ran, you know, the YouTube ad, um, counts for the Google ad grant. So no, unfortunately, YouTube doesn't work for Google grants. But one thing I will tell you is that if you haven't opened a paid account before, um, almost always you can get a hundred dollar credit 
for opening your first account. So you have to have a credit card attached to it, but um, you could just set that campaign for $100 and you could build a YouTube campaign and then the campaign could be over, use that for year end. And then if you have success, then awesome, invest more money into the paid advertising. And if you don't, then it didn't cost you anything. So there's different offers that go on. Sometimes it's like spend a hundred, get 200 or get a hundred dollar credit for just even opening an account. But I would definitely recommend trying to see if you can find some kind of offer um, to open that and it's definitely worth it to use it on YouTube. And then Katrina also asked, was this the ad for this whole 20 minute video? Yeah, that was a 20 minute ad. Um, the way that YouTube works is that you basically post whatever, like normally you just post a YouTube video to your YouTube channel. Um, and then when you run the ad, you choose that video from your YouTube channel selection. And so it's actually what also is pretty cool is when people are watching that as an ad, it counts as a video view on your video organically as well. So you're kind of getting, feeding two birds with one hand. Um, I think Isabel had a good question. She says, we do a good job converting one-time donors to recurring, but haven't cracked the nut on recurring as a first-time ask. Any suggestions? We do a job converting one-time donors to recurring, but haven't cracked the nut on recurring as a first-time ask. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, you know, moving someone um, into a recurring giver right off the bat. I often, like you're saying, seeing people go from one-time donors to recurring, but, you know, it might not be as much on the advertising piece and a little bit more on the donation platform. So fun, I know I've been plugging fundraise up really hard, <laughs> but they're honestly some of the, one of the better platforms out there for doing this. And it also utilizes and leverages machine learning. And so they will very subtly <laughs> on fundraise up donation pages, you know, put user towards a recurring ask versus a one-time, like fold in those pages, make those stand out. Um, and then they're really good at pushing people, even if they go to do a one-time, moving them into a recurring, or if they took the process of a one-time, moving them into a recurring gift. What's also cool about Fundraise Up is based off of if that person's donated before, they'll see unique dynamic donation suggestions and in, in size. You know, if this person has given a thousand dollar gift in the past, we're not going to ask them to give a five, 10, 15, 20 dollar gift. We're going to ask a hundred, two fifty, five hundred, a thousand again. And so it, it actually has that data collected and will give people suggested gift amounts based off how they've engaged with that organization in the past. So it's, it's pretty cool. And Gina said, for our org, it is difficult to find the right action message for fundraising since our org is not really an action org. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions on headlines or subjects that tend to work best for ads? Hmm. If action messages aren't really on brand and that's not work, that's not what works for you all. Um, I would, I would go back and look at like your organic posting history and see what usually engages your audience and your followers. Like you don't have to go that route if that isn't what resonates well with your audiences. Um, like I mentioned, I would actually for you all kind of start with a boosted post maybe, like work with an old post that had a lot of traction and put five to $10 behind that. It'll have you reach a broader audience and see how that performs and if you get more traction on that. Um, and then if you do, um, then you can maybe take some of the language that are in those posts and use those in ads. But I totally agree. Like we have tons of partners where we go from engaging with her um, supporters all year long in one kind of tone. And then we've tried to switch it up for year end and be more action oriented and it just didn't land with them. So you, you absolutely don't have to if you don't need to. But um, if you do, I would say just suggest or I would suggest just testing a lot of different things and, and looking at what works. And then I think Isabel was following up on the iOS 15, the, the private relay, I think she said it was called, um, which allows Apple users to opt out of website tracking. Yeah, so, okay, thank you for reminding me. 
that, I think that's more specific to email. Um, iOS 15 is going to be impacting email. I don't believe iOS 14 uh, impacted email. It was more just pixel tracking on site. And then I think iOS 15 is an update to that. Um, I think I, I, I read an article on, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, it was like specific to email stuff. Um, thanks for that reminder, Isabel. And Katrina asked, do you know if the social proof you talked about earlier on Facebook would be the same on YouTube? i.e. if you're using an existing video on your channel for an ad that already has views, comments, et cetera, would, the pull th would that pull through? Yeah, that's a really good question. It wouldn't for the YouTube advertising. Uh, if you're doing the TrueView um, ads, it won't show up with likes or views in the ad. If someone clicks through and goes to YouTube and then is reading all the comments, then course like you can see how that's impacted charity waters ad um you know it, it does work in the way where the more comments and likes and shares on the ad the the cheaper it's going to be for you um and like basically google and facebook's model is user experience um they want users to have a good experience if they're not having a good experience if they're down voting or high bounce rates they're not going to show your ads anymore because they want to make sure that people are continuing to use their platform. Um, so having those kinds of engagements, comments will help your advertising and make it perform better. But technically, the YouTube ad itself won't show the likes and shares, whereas like a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad will show that. Um, so it would only be the same if someone clicked through and went to YouTube. All right. We have another question. Do you have any tips for organizations that have a giving guide approach to year end giving? It feels like a weird hybrid between shopping and donating. Should we lean into one or the other? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. Like, what have you found more success with one or the other as you've run those campaigns? And I guess you could like unmute if you wanted to talk this out since there are a lot of things in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, so a lot of organizations that have both a shopping co component and a donating component, we, we do usually run both during year end, but they're like very different appeals. I mean, we're running different language in the ads, different audiences. Um, you know, typically we try to if we can have an e-commerce store, if it's shopping um, or, you know, a fundraising page for donations so that we don't even really have audience overlap if we can help it. Um, that way we can truly see which is performing better. Um, but I don't think you necessarily have to go with one or the other. You can totally test both. Just try to keep it as segmented as possible. And then and feel free to unmute too, you guys, if you have any questions or um, you have a follow-up question for Blake as well. Okay. Um, but we've got some more. Does the free video tool that comes with Google Ads, is that available as well with the Google Ad Grant? No, so unfortunately, um, Google Grants is limited to search ads only. You know, we meet with the Google for Nonprofits team quite a bit. Um, we are a, a partner of theirs. And that's one of the things we always ask them. They're probably tired of us, <laughs> of hearing that from us. It's like, when are we gonna have some kind of YouTube component or when are we gonna have display ads? Um, right now, that's not a capability. And I think the reason why is because display and YouTube are associated with different networks. Um, the Google, you know, when you build a Google ad grant search campaign, you're only in that search network and it's pretty limited. Um, display and YouTube kind of opens it up to a whole nother world. And I don't know, they're just, they've been resistant to giving the capability to ad grant users. Um, but one thing I, I, I will mention is a little bit tangential to your question. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that there are remarketing capabilities within the ad grant. Um, so typically we're using YouTube and display for building remarketing audiences, but you can do a little bit of that in the grant. It's called RLSA or remarketing list search ads. 
So just like you would with Facebook or another channel, if someone visits a page on your site, you can build an audience of those people that have been to a certain page. And then if that person then searches something related to, you know, supporting World Water Day, you can create layers where you say, I want to target a search campaign when someone is searching World Water Day, but they've also been on our landing page in the last 30 days. And so that's usually a good option for people that have already spent, they're spending their full $10,000 grant every single month, but they want to get more conversion out of, um, you know, they're trying to get more out of the money they're spending. And so it's prioritizing high quality search of pe searches of people that have been on your site before. Let me know if that doesn't make sense. But um, if you search RLSA Google, they have a ton of really great support articles on like how to build that out. And, then, and looks like Isabel asked, what is the time spend for testing with Google Optimize? Thinking of A-B testing, button colors, headlines, et cetera, in the main page. Is it a process basically building a second main page with the changes? That's a really good question. Yeah, and that's something I'm, I maybe should have prefaced a bit. Like Google Optimize, it really depends on what your site is built with. Um, if it's like a custom coded website, it might be a little bit more challenging to have the changes that you make in Google Optimize actually stay on your site. So the tool itself is really easy to use. For example, um, I, I could probably send out a video or something after this, or you can find them on YouTube. But basically the tool is kind of like a landing page builder where you can select different parts of a site. And then like you said, you can choose if you wanna change the font or the color of a button or something like that. Um, the problem is depending on how your site is coded, those changes might not always um, fit. So if you're on WordPress or like a open source uh, builder like Wix or something else, it'll, it'll be easier for you to have Google Tag Manager changes apply. Something that's custom is going to be tougher. But as far as like the time to actually learn it and test it, I would say if you're pretty savvy, you could probably get something going in like a couple hours. Um, I, would, I would probably start with copy changes first. Those are the easiest to implement. So you can just focus on copy changes. Um, and then the testing you can do new users versus returning users. That's like one of the easiest first tests. And then once you have your bearings, you can start to focus on like changing donation button colors, reformatting, things like that. Um, let me, and really quick, there's someone that is like my favorite Google um, optimize YouTube guru. <laughs> uh, so it's from, let me just mute myself for a second. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to continue to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, we do have some more time left today to dive into any issues you guys are experiencing, any of your struggles you're having with anything year end related. Um, we can use this time to, to work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Isabel, his name is, or is his YouTube channel called Loves Data. Um, and he, he does a Google Optimize tutorial. It's from like June of 2020. And he has some updated versions, um, but he's, he's great. Take the very slow and walk you through how to actually use the tool. Um, perfect. Do you have any other questions? Like Karen said, we have plenty of time to go through anything else if you have any. And then of course, um, I'm available as a resource or our, our sales team is as well. You know, they usually do a lot of the, the auditing. Um, and so, or, or myself, I'm here as a resource. So if you have any specific questions about your account, I know Brooke had said she wanted to take a look and do an audit, happy to do that as well. You can just totally reach out to us and we can make that happen. Um, the one thing that I don't feel like was covered in this is we've been doing a lot of uh, digital marketing, just ads being, um, you know, like insert into your email newsletter and other places. Do you have any tips or tricks for year end digital marketing campaigns? 
Sorry. So are you saying specifically for um, like for email? No, for inserted ads. So like when you're reading a, a news article online, you know, you see that ad for those shoes for the website that you visited. Um, yeah. We've been doing a lot of that and having good success on there. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts, um, tips, tricks for year end. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're specifically talking about like display ads where someone's been on a site, like for like the most classic example is you went to Nordstrom or something and checked out a pair of shoes. And then now you're seeing those banner ads kind of follow you across the internet. Um, am I correct in understanding that? Yes. Yeah. Display can be super effective. Um, display is a, a great tool for brand awareness and kind of like YouTube in a way, you actually only pay when someone clicks on the ad, you don't get charged on an impression basis. So, you know, $100, $200 can go a pretty long way. I think the key to having success with display is making sure that the display ad, um, they're small. So it's kind of hard to do this effectively, but make sure that it, it really represents what the fundraising campaign is. Like typically we find that when someone clicks on the display ad and then they go to a landing page, a fundraising page that matches, that's going to be really, really effective. And help someone know that they're on the right track or they're, you know, this is associated. There are a lot of display ads out there that can be kind of um, predatory almost, like they're not really associated with uh, the remarketing. And so you wanna make sure that you're making that person, person feel comfortable and uh, they, they have trust in where they're going. And then really the key to display is all in the placement targeting. So one of the first things that we do when we're running display is make sure that we're excluding mobile apps as a targeting placement. Because unfortunately, Google makes a lot of money off, you know, it's a parent's iPad or it's their phone and they're letting their kids use the phone. So maybe you would set your demographic targeting to target someone between the ages of 35 and 55 and you think that you have this awesome demographic, but realistically your ads are getting shown to a five-year-old that's playing some app so one of the first things we do to save money is to exclude mobile placements um, on those phones. We also usually exclude like R-rated or X-rated content because that's those people aren't really looking to convert, um, especially for nonprofits. So we exclude that that as well. That'll really help with like the efficiency in your targeting. And then usually let those display ads run for three to five days. Maybe not even. Maybe like three days. And you can go into placements in your Google Ads account and you can see where your ad is showing up the most. And so from there, we look at impressions, clicks, most importantly, sounds like you're having success. So donations or conversions. And we just up the bid, meaning we're bidding more in auction um, to show up in certain placements. And then we exclude the placements that don't look effective. So uh, if there are a lot of it, it might work for you, but sometimes we find, you know, this organization is based in the US and there are a lot of like very foreign websites that we're showing up on that just don't seem like a good fit. We'll exclude those and then we'll basically double down on placements that are performing. It might be like a news plate placement. It might be associated website, um, something like that. And another question in the chat was, do you have experience with setting up a shop catalog within Facebook and using it to run dynamic ads? Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so do you have experience in um, a catalog in Facebook? It really depends, honestly, on how many, how many products you have. Um, if you have a you pretty have expensive catalog, I would say it's worth it because of that dynamic option, if we're talking like two or three products, um, might not, the juice might not be worth the squeeze. Um, but if you do have a lot of dynamic products, um, it can be pretty, yeah, approximately 20 products. I would say it's probably worth it in your case, yeah. And this doesn't always work. Um, Facebook support is not as built out as like Google ad support, but there are ways for you to get in contact with a Facebook rep 
and they can actually help you build that out. They're incentivized to, for better or for worse <laughs> to get you to spend money. And if they think that you're gonna do more e-commerce advertising on Facebook by having a catalog, they will help you set that up. Um, so if you're in your ads manager and you go over to, like, to the little question mark and you ask for help, you'll either have the option to chat with a support specialist or send them an email. And trust me, they will happily get on the call with you and help you build that all out. I guess a question that I saw when we run this presentation previously was um, people sometimes don't know which channel they should prioritize, like what channel is the most impactful when it comes to running these year end campaigns. So I don't know if you can shed some light on that, but if it's better to use Facebook and Instagram versus the YouTube or display or, you know, search Google ad grant, like how would you kind of break that down? It's a really great question, Karen. Um, I think that if you, if you've tested them all before and you have a good idea of like which one's converting, which one's not, that's important. I think the way I think about it is like, what is your, your budget and also how built up is your social following? Like if you have a really big Facebook page and an Instagram following, definitely invest in Facebook. I, I find that Facebook is probably the most impactful um, when it comes to ge generating donations, especially during year end and Giving Tuesday, um, it, it moves the needle the most. Um, but there are a lot of campaigns, so that, that is like for targeting just followers. I would say that if you're not currently using the Google Ad Grant, that's a massive missed opportunity. Um, is there anyone here that, that's not using the Google Ad Grant? I think maybe everyone's using it. Um, you're not using it, Kelly. Are you, you we are, some people aren't. Are you, are you all a uh, healthcare organization? Okay. Um, are you, are you all pretty familiar with it? Is there like a main reason why you're not using it? Finally got your setup yesterday. Awesome, Brooke. Don't know it. So the Google ad grant is actually a, a free tool or it's a, it's a free program from Google. Um, their, their nonprofit arm, Google for nonprofits. And essentially it gives you $10,000 in free advertising every single month. Um, and so it's an in-kind credit. Basically it's an advertising credit that you can use to target users based off of what they're searching online. Um, so it can be really, really effective for starting to build, like that's the foundation. I usually recommend the Google ad grant first you can get a lot of people to come to your website and then you can start to build remarketing audiences for other tools like Facebook and LinkedIn. So if you're not using the grant, I highly suggest testing it out. It depends, like some people have mentioned, what kind of organization you are, um, but the majority can get approved within like a week. Um, the process is pretty straightforward. They, they really streamlined it. So look into it. If you have a tech soup already, it'll take you like, three to five days at the most. Um, or you can talk to us and we can help you set that up. But it's, it's a great program and a great place to start. Um, and then from there, like I said, if you have a following, Facebook is great. But then if you're starting to really want to target like specific users, like maybe you have a corporate giving campaign, LinkedIn is really the place for that because you can target by business and then you can target by um, title you know, at that company. So if you want to target someone who is in a specific arm of that organization or a C-level um, exec, you can, you can do that on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's a little bit more expensive, um, probably in my opinion, like the most expensive of all the channels, but it does have that ability to tar target users at their title, which is pretty cool. And you can target specific sections of like a, a business. So hopefully that's helpful. A lot of chat back and forth about awesome. in the Google ad. Well, it looks like um, Brooke had a seven month process, but hey, you nailed it right before a year and that's awesome. I'm glad that you got that all set up. And then people are saying they keep getting companies who want, this is Jason, uh, keep getting companies who want to charge us money to use the service. 
So there are definitely agencies out there who will charge you for setup and who will charge you to manage it. Um, you know, it really depends on like what your goals are. Uh, if it's something where you just, you know, you just want to get it set up and test it and learn if you have the time and the bandwidth, then you absolutely don't have to pay someone to manage it. Um, Google is doing, has been doing a better job of trying to make it uh, an intuitive program and platform uh, for anyone to use. And there really isn't a downside because it's free money. So even if you're not doing like the best job that you're learning, um, Google will give you some guidance on like, hey, here are recommendations, this is what you need to clean up, or hey, this is actually not working, you should get rid of that. So don't be intimidated by it. You should definitely watch, um, you know, the, vi the videos they have on YouTube and they actually have a free Google one-on-one -on -one training course. And actually at Community Boost, we offer a free, we built our own Google Ad Grant program um, at the training and Karen, I don't see a problem why we couldn't just give that out to anyone that's here. I mean, right now we're offering it as a free resource anyway. So if anyone would like that, yeah. um, we can send you over our, our one-on-one -on -one training on how to use Google Grants. And that might actually be a great first step for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Send me an email. Um, you guys should all have my email. I sent out the Zoom link for this. If you go ahead and reply um, and let me know you're interested in that, and I can get that to you. Yep. And I, and I would be remiss to not plug ourselves because we <laughs> absolutely do Google Ad Grant Management. I would say that we're probably one of the best out there. Um, but yeah, you happy to talk to you all about that as well. Um, Renato is saying that she struggles to use the full amount and there doesn't seem to be enough search volume for the keywords they qualify for. Yeah, and you know, I think there's kind of this misconception about the Google Ad Grant because it's ten thousand dollars, like people needing to spend all of that budget. And honestly, we've had a lot of conversations with the Google team about bringing the budget down. Not that not that we were pushing that, but like just having that conversation because there are a lot of people who feel like they aren't succeeding or finding success with it because they're not spending the full ten thousand. And that's really not the goal of the grant. Like the grant is not to spend. $10,000 a month. Um, the, the goal of the grant is to go after high quality searches and actually have those people to take some kind of action. Like any day, I would rather like consult for a partner of mine to spend $2,500 of the grant on high quality keywords of people that are actually donating versus spending $10,000 on keywords that really don't make sense for the organization, even though we're sending traffic to the site. So really it's all about quality with the Google Ad Grant. And if a lot of times, if you focus on quality, um, that will actually help you spend more. If you get a higher quality score in the account, like I mentioned, Google cares about user experience, that will help you start to ramp up spend. And sometimes you need to be a little bit tangential with the keywords you're going after. Like for example, a lot of my museum partners, um, you know, of course, we want to be going after museum in X area, or uh, we want to go after, you know, science museum here. Like those are high quality keywords, but they're also very competitive. And often we'll find that keywords like things to do in area or summer activities in whatever area, even though they're tangential, actually are some of our top performers because they're less competitive um, and you know, we can go after those all day and still get people to buy a ticket or donate or support. So sometimes you just have to be a little bit creative about the keyword research. Um, and people are saying, I'm curious how folks work with other, this is Isabel. I'm curious how folks who work with other departments, marketing development on digital campaigns, who crafts appeals and who runs the technical pieces. It sounds like Jason does a lot of it on their own. Yeah, I mean, I, I can even like, it's a, anecdotally, at Community Boost, I usually find that, you know, no one knows an organization better than, like their mission better than they do. And so often when it comes to like crafting the appeals and things like that, um, initially we, organizations should probably craft out of that messaging 
we're at, and then an agency or consultant can help share how you can make it appeal to whatever platform it's going to be on. Um, so it's it's kind of a it's a, a process that we work on together. And then over time, you know, if we have partners that have been here for three to four years, they trust that we can craft those appeals and we know the organization and we can take that on. But, you know, often coming from uh, the org first is important. Oh yeah, and this is a good good point from Brooke. Like Google does actually have um, an internship program where it's people that are studying marketing or business um, and they get a training and then they can take on your Google ad grant um, uh, for you. I, I would say that like the, some of those interns, I, I've seen uh, a mixed bag of work. Some of it's like pretty solid. Some of it is not done as well and you know, you, you need to have someone go in and clean up some of the work that they did. So take that for what it is. And then I'm not sure people are saying, oh, excited about the Google resource, the, the training. Absolutely, we'll send that out. Um, I'm actually, we're really proud of it. We put a lot of time into building it. And the reason we did it is because Google has their trainings, but it's specific to Google ads. And that's like display and video and, and video and something included with the Google ad grant. So um, we think that you would all really, really like it. And then do you do quarterly reviews or is it only a regular contracted service? Yeah, so like our, our typical program is four months. Um, that gives us enough time. It sounds like you already have a Google ad grant and are pretty ahead of it but usually it gets enough time for setup, build, and then like three months of optimizations and getting things into a really great place. And then we do what's called a roadmap review where we um, walk everyone, you know, we walk that partner through the results, um, how things performed, return on investment, all of that. And then we also recommend other channels depending on the results, you know, maybe, Google Ad Grant worked really, really well and you don't have a social following. And so we're not gonna recommend Facebook, but we might recommend display or YouTube or something like that. And then Joy says, perhaps we should do another webinar on training for Google Ad Grant. I think that could be a really cool idea. And I'm sure Karen's- Yeah, totally down always open to suggestions and, and wanting to know what you guys are most interested in. So I've, I've already made a note of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jason had to go. No problem. Thanks for being here, Jason. Um, yeah, I just appreciate everyone participating and contributing to the chat. It's been an awesome discussion. We still have time. So if anyone has any other questions, happy to um, answer those. But so far, this has been great. Though. So thank you so much for your time and for staying on. Yeah, of course, of course. No problem. And keep an eye out for an email for me. I will send out this recording and hook you guys up with that Google Ad Grant resource. And um, again, you know, we're Community Boost. We're here to help you scale your impact. And if you want to get in contact with us, feel free to shoot me an email or visit our website. Thank you so much, y'all. Really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Have a great issue today. Bye.